and get, grab your Bible and we're going to end up in uh, Matthew 6 is where the Lord's Prayer is. Uh, and if you have a pew Bible there in front of you, um, we are memorizing it together in the ESV. Again, welcome everyone online. We've got a lot of people uh, watching online. It's hard to believe that um, this whole virus thing is still a thing. And if you have kids in school, you know it is still wreaking havoc, schedules and all the stuff. So uh, mask, no mask, uh, wear a mask. If you would prefer, um, we're all trying to make it through uh, this season still. If the last two years have taught us anything, I think it's taught us, I hope it's taught us, we're a bit more fragile, um, a bit more vulnerable than we thought we were. Uh, to, to consider the fact that something that happens on the other side of the planet, a place like China, other side of the globe can actually impact my life right here, right now, my family, in my home, even my own life. We are connected, aren't we? Some say we live in a small, small world and I think never before in my lifetime have we quite seen this. A one issue world, a one focus world globally that's impacted all of us. But what we have learned, you would think something like that would unify us. Actually, it's kind of divided us in a lot of ways. We became more disconnected. So we learned over the past couple of years what we should have already known and should learn in greater degree. We can't control nature. We can't control human nature. To be human is to be vulnerable. To be human is to be in need. You might know this. Uh, you could go for about 40 days or so without food before your body just, you know, can't take it anymore. You can go for about three days without water. Three days. Wednesday, you and I, we're done. You can go for about four minutes without oxygen, depending on who you are. You take away an organ like a heart, have, a, have an aneurysm or heart attack, and you are gone in a moment. And you're already thinking, Pastor, thank you thus far for this uplifting message. We were really, really grateful to be here. My point is this, to be human is to be in need. And, and, and if you remember Maslow's hierarchy of needs, it doesn't take a scientist or psychologist to figure this out. The physiological needs are the baseline, right? We're not going to do much unless our natural needs are met. Our physiological needs are met. And among those who are alive on this planet, humans are more fragile and more in need than most. Though we like to think we're at the top of it all because we are created in the image of God. Think about this. Of all the ways that God could have created you and me, any way that he wanted to, he created us to be in need, to be dependent on him. That should tell us a lot right there. In fact, J.N. Darby was an 1800s preacher, theologian, a Plymouth Brethren, British theologian. He's the one who said, necessity finds him out. Think about that. You don't find much of anything in life. You don't discover much of anything in life. Go after anything apart from your need for it. We only find God when we recognize our need for him. Precisely why so many people never quite find him. Our sin gets in the way, our pride gets in the way, and today we jump to a portion of the Lord's Prayer, or cover a portion of it, that we, we often tend to jump to. Give us this day our daily bread. And what I mean is we often enter prayer, Lord, here's what I need, here's what I need, here's what I need, are more likely, I want you to consider your own prayer life, what I want. What I want is this. What I want is to be released from this challenge. I want to be released from this pain, this relational strain. What I want is more of this. And so we reduce prayer to our coming before him, asking him for things. Think about it. Isn't prayer me asking for God to do things? And then his role is to, is to respond, to act. My role is to request he responds. And if that is prayer for you, you're going to live a frustrated, 
prayer life, Christian life. Because the moment he doesn't respond in the way you want him to, your faith goes off the rails. So here's what we're doing. We're learning to pray each line within the context of this sweeping prayer that's called the Lord's Prayer. And for me personally, I'm just telling you, in the study that I've been a part of for the past couple months and, and beyond, but in recent days, this prayer, getting underneath each line in it, is transforming my prayer life yet again. So we're memorizing it. We're, we're learning it. We're repeating it. Three times a day, we're repeating it out loud before him in the morning pray it at noon pray it at night before you go to bed pray it if you're living with others have a roommate or, or friends or or perhaps family pray it together and that's what I want us to do right now to pray it together as we're learning it and memorizing we'll help you out on the screen okay our father in heaven hallowed be your name your kingdom come your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen and amen. We've said that the Lord's Prayer is the entire essence of the Christian life. It's a summation of a kingdom person. It's prayed by kingdom people. We talked about last week. Those who are praying and seeking for his will to be done, his kingdom to come on earth as it is in the very heart and will of God through our lives. This is a prayer for disciples. Uh, one writer said it's a handbook for holiness. And so as we learn to pray, as he's taught us to pray, we find this one phrase right there in the middle of it. Give us this day our daily bread, Matthew 6, 11. Now here in Dallas, North Dallas in particular, this prayer seems to be um, kind of a misplaced prayer for us. Frankly, we, we probably had something to eat today. You probably don't wake up every day wondering where might my food come from. Now, if you've traveled the world and even to our mission partners, many of them, where I have gone to places in Africa, places in the Middle East, places even in South America, we've gone to places where literally this is a desperate prayer. Can you imagine being a parent waking up? I've seen it in West Africa. Uh, I've seen it in Nigeria. I've seen it in places like uh, Kenya and other parts of the world where we go to places where parents are praying for food for their children for the day. So this, this prayer for us in North Dallas seems to be irrelevant. Our prayers likely are something more like, um, let's see, when this, when this is done... Uh, let me say, I don't know if I'm even, Lord, Italian? I, mean, I don't know. Mexican would be good today. Perhaps maybe a burger would be outstanding. I don't know, maybe I could go home. I've got lots of options, perhaps. But we also know that there are those even within our city who are without. This prayer reminds us that God is the one who provides for our needs. But too often what we do, we jump to this portion of the prayer. Prayer becomes, here's what I need, here's what I need, here's what I want. And, and what happens is our greed gets in the way of grace. Prayer itself is an act of grace. God making a way for us through Christ to come before him. And to put this in context, you see, Jesus says when you pray to the Holy One of Israel, Yahweh, come before him, call him Abba. Call him father. If you're a disciple, if you have received Christ, he's now your father. Very intimate, very close to you. He loves you. And yes, he's in heaven, which means not that we're assigning him off to some place, we've noted, but instead to say that he's in heaven is to say he's not assigned to any particular place. He's everywhere. He is, he is transcendent. He's spirit. He's always with us. You can't confine him anywhere. And so he's here with us and he's holy. He is unlike us. We, we've talked about that. And then last week we talked about how our prayer at the center of it all, the center of our lives, is that his will would be done, that his kingdom would come through us as it is in heaven, meaning 
right in line with the will of God. And then he says, as you pray that way, now focus in on your needs for the day. You see how this works? You see how prayer is comprehensive. We, we know that he's taught us to pray like this because we are kingdom people. But right in the middle of this sweeping prayer that we come before God and, and call out to him is this humble petition for daily bread. And what I want you to see today, three things. No need is too small as we come before God in prayer. Secondly, no need is too big. And then finally, all needs are met in him. First, no need is too small. In the context of kingdom living, again, I want you to know today, friends, hear this. No need is trivial to God. No need that you have when you come to him in prayer. I think sometimes, I know I have felt this way in my life, like, I, I don't, I, Lord, I'm sorry, I'm praying for this. Like, that's so, that's so silly for me to be praying about this little thing. But not like a father who cares for his children. Whatever your needs are, he wants to hear. He wants you to come to him. We bring our smallest needs to him. All week long, you can pray any moment, bringing your needs to him. And again, at first glance, this seems a bit irrelevant. But there are those who are even in our city who are without And so this prayer reminds us that he has provided for us. Maybe it's more of a prayer of gratitude for you, right? Lord, uh, give me today my daily bread. But what we're going to learn today is that bread will represent anything that you need to sustain your life so that you might serve him. Bread represents all that you need to serve the Lord. Again, the context, I'm a kingdom person. I'm living for you. I seek to glorify you, to bring your kingdom, your will through my life into everyone I encounter today. Now, Lord, give me the very smallest things that I need, whatever they might be. I wonder if you've been like me, um, where I come before the Lord. I've been journaling uh, my prayers for, since I was in college. And part of that is not because I'm super spiritual, but because it would help me focus uh, my prayers and still does today. And so I'll, I'll, I'll write down my prayers. I'll spend some time in silent meditation. Uh, I've told you recently, I, I follow what's called the Lectio Divina, the divine reading, which is a real simple way to simply approach scripture, to read it, to contemplate it. I'll write down what I'm hearing from God, what he's saying to me, sometimes in my own Bible, sometimes in my journal. And then what is that? How will I act on that? And then how can I pray out of that? And then I'll write down have specific prayers during each week. I pray for leaders on certain days. I pray for my staff team. I pray for you regularly and people in need. I pray for friends of mine who are pastors and shepherds in our city and around the world. I pray for missionaries that we know. We pray constantly. I'm praying for my family, you can imagine, always. But here's what happens for me sometimes. I'll start to pray and see if this doesn't happen for you. And maybe I'm a little strange, but I'll be praying. I'll say, Lord, and then uh, today. So now that I've, I'm focused on today, I pray for, Lord, I got that meeting at nine o'clock and that's, that's an important meeting. Well, I'm, I'm leading that meeting. I've got to get, I've got to get ready for that meeting. Uh, and, then, and, then, and then 10 o'clock, that's going to be, wow, I've got that. That's going to be a tough, tough meeting. And then I know I need to call that person. And then I'm dealing with Lord and I know they're struggling with this. And I've got a family member who's really struggling. Lord, I pray for them. Right now. And, then I, and, then God, and then tonight, tonight I've got that. Oh, I've got, that's tonight. And then I've got that meeting tonight. And I'm going to have to be, and so I'm, oh, now I'm anxious. Lord, I'm really anxious now. I'm really worried now in my prayers. But here's what I've learned. Listen. Turn your anxieties into prayer. You see, our anxieties and our worries, our needs, that's prayer. He wants us to come to to him with all that we have. And so when I used to really feel guilty and, oh, I'm sorry, (laughs) my mind's running to all kinds of craziness. You have promised peace in your presence. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. And I can hear his his spirit. No, 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 come on. Where else are you going to take that? Cast all your anxieties on him because he cares for you. You see, this prayer reminds us there's no prayer that's too small to bring before him. And though we tend to stress and get anxious about things that really don't matter in the end, he says, no, you come to me. But this prayer also reminds us to to remain where we ought to be. Little children in need. A child must be fed by a parent or it doesn't survive. 
And here's what's so radical about this prayer. What seems to be such a simple teaching from Jesus, yet again, ends up being so powerful. And it's this, give us this day our daily bread. Give us the bread that we need only for today. Throughout the scripture, God teaches us. He wants to teach his children. And Jesus does this over and over again to live one moment at a time. I've talked a lot about this in recent days. Such a powerful truth for me over the past couple of years that's really helped me. One way to live without the anxieties and worries of the future, the regrets of the past, is to stay focused in the moment. You might remember in Exodus 16, God is teaching his people to trust him. And so they're out in the wilderness. They have no food to eat. And he says, I'm going to provide food for you one day at a time. He's going to bring manna from heaven. You collect enough just for one day. And tomorrow, trust me, don't worry about tomorrow. Today and then the day before Sabbath, collect twice as much. Don't have to work on the Sabbath. Watch, I'm going to provide for you. Even on the Sabbath when you're resting, I'm still working. One of the hardest things for some of us to do is actually rest and stop producing. As we sang earlier, our worth is not found in what we own or what we produce. It's found in him. We rest in him. Gospel peace comes to us. Rest as we live for him one day at a time. And then in Matthew 6, Jesus says it again in Matthew 6, 25. Therefore, I tell you, do not be anxious about your life. And here he says, don't be anxious about what you eat, what you're going to drink, nor about your body. Some of us worry so much about what we're going to put on, what clothes we're going to wear. Some folks can heart, they're stripped by, by anxiety, struck by anxiety, and they, they can hardly even go out in the public. Don't know what I'm going to wear to church. Not sure. Listen, come as you are. You come and don't worry about it is what Jesus says. Isn't life more than food and the body more than clothing? And then in verse 34, later he says this, you know it. Therefore, do not be anxious about tomorrow. For tomorrow will have, will will be anxious for itself. You have enough worries for tomorrow that'll come. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. Focus on today. See, our prayer for daily bread helps us to focus in the moment. Just want to remind you today, I so want this for you. So many of us are forfeiting the peace and the joy, the moment, because we're worried about the future. And others of us are robbing ourselves and others around us of the joy of the present because we continue to regret the past and our mistakes that we've made in the past. I so so want this for you. I've said it recently, where the action is, friends, in the kingdom of God is no other place than right here right now we live in the moment and as we focus on people that God's put right in front of us the task he's placed right before us right now not an, not an hour from now not to ne- not this afternoon not tomorrow right now we live one moment at a time and it draws us to the center of our lives because our lives are made up of moments and as disciples you embody we embody this daily petition Lord, give me what I need right now. This is a prayer of humility. It's a prayer of focus. It's a prayer of contentment. And it's a prayer of gratitude. I love that anthem that the choir sang for us earlier. Just remind us how how good he is. Oh, how good you are to us. Gratitude fills our hearts and we're able to praise him and to live for him in the moment. No prayer, no need is too small. Watch this, no need is too big. Because as kingdom people, we we do praise him for the food that we have to eat, the simple stuff of life, but our needs go way beyond just the need for a meal, right? In fact, a lot of us, we could probably eat less in our day. Our our needs go beyond food, right? Our needs go out into relationships, to work, to all that we'll have, all the things we've kind of already talked about. And when we're propelled outward as kingdom people, because we are, here's the tension, we're going to live our our lives focused on others, as Jesus did, as I'm I'm understanding the kingdom of God more and more. It It is working and serving and living for the common good of others in my home, friendships, in our city, 
to serve others. That's how his kingdom is advanced as we do so in the name of Jesus. We forget to become what we ourselves need. We, we, we must become what we ourselves have received. And so what happens when we pray, Lord, give us this day our daily bread. We're praising him for it. It's why it is appropriate to pray before a meal. Pray before every meal. Many of you pray it in public. Many of you follow a practice that often I'll do with a, with a waiter or waitress. Hey, we're about to pray here in a moment. Can we, can we pray for you? Because we're so glad, we're grateful that you're serving us today. And then give them a big tip <laughs> to thank them. I've never had anybody, go, now you don't need to be praying for me. Or no, I have to be an atheist. Don't be praying for me. I've never had anybody say that to me. They're moved by that. They, they want you to pray for them. Or maybe it's just a little, I don't know. I don't know you. I'm not going to go into my life. But it is falling apart right now. But we pray before every meal because we thank him for what he's given to us. And in so doing, we recognize the fact there are those who are without. And so it draws us out. Not just bread, but so many needs of people in our lives. You See, you too can feed others. Literally. You can take someone to lunch. Pay for their meal. You can provide for others. Uh, Stacy and I have been on the receiving end of this from our church family. When we have been in need, uh, whether it's been ill or, or some, something else, that, that the church families come to us with food at the front door. And it means so much. It's a simple act. We can do this with neighbors that we know who are hurting. We can literally feed others. And in fact, your giving is literally feeding people around the world with our mission partners. In places like the slums of India, during the pandemic, we were able to help serve children in need. Some food deserts, even here in Dallas, where people are likely, again, not gonna die of starvation, but not healthy food to eat. In our own city, we can make a difference. And here's another thing that, that draws us out. When the needs of others around us become so overwhelming, we remember that we care for one person at a time. That's how the kingdom comes. And so you, you may know this, that Jesus, I love this about Jesus, by the way. Uh, don't be guilty, you know, don't feel guilty. I'm not trying to guilt anyone into the fact that we, we have food to eat. Praise him for it. We can eat in moderation. Jesus, I love this. He loved to eat and drink. Do you know this? He loved to do so. We see it throughout scripture in the New Testament. And he's always, he made it a habit to eat and drink with all the wrong people. And I love that about him as well. We laugh, but I wonder, when's the last time you ate with the wrong person? Somebody, you like, maybe it's someone in your office. People don't like that person. Yeah, and they feel all alone. Because they're, they're you know, they're special. I mean, they got, ex, they got some extra needs, extra grace required. And they're dying on the inside. You're the one person. You would be the one. To buck the system and everybody goes, wow, watch, you see her going? She's associated with their friends. Because if so, are you willing to love like that? Jesus did. In fact, in Luke 15, it says, now uh, tax collectors and sinners were, were all drawn near to him. <laughs> are you a magnet for sinners? And by the way, we're all wrong, aren't we? Jesus made it a habit of eating with the wrong people. And someday, we're going to find ourselves at the great banquet of eternity with all the wrong people, including me and including you. It goes on to say that, look at this, the subject of Jesus' love for people, all the wrong people, became, became uh, the, the, the conversation and the gossip of the Pharisees and the Pharisees and the scribes grumbled saying, this man receives sinners and eats with them. And Jesus wore those kinds of accusations like a badge of honor. Do you? In Matthew 11, this is Jesus. He says, the son of man came eating and drinking. And they said, look at him, a glutton and a drunkard, a friend of tax collectors and sinners, yet wisdom is justified. By your deeds. He's saying, listen, I'm showing the wisdom of God, the multifaceted wisdom of God by throwing a party for all the wrong people. You and I can do the same. This is what he continues to do today. So 
Who could it be that you would literally invite out to eat and provide bread for them? Even this week, it could be someone in need. Again, maybe it's someone in your school or someone in your family you could just reach out to. You know, the more I, I consider the kingdom of God, the more I see that it's, it is meeting one need at a time, one person at a time. So no need is too small. No need is too big. And finally, all needs are met in him. See, here's the twist. We don't come to God in prayer simply for provision. We first come to him for his presence. Because what he does offer us, his best gift to us, with all the many gifts he gives us, is himself. We come to him because we get him. Many people think, well, you come to Christ, you're forgiven, and now your life's going to be all great, and people around you get their act together, and you get your act together, and we realize, no, that really doesn't happen. In fact, life for believers can often be more difficult for a lot of reasons in our culture. The gospel is not, I receive Jesus and everything goes well with me. The gospel is, I get him and he is enough regardless of what comes in, comes in my life because I have his presence with me all the time. The best gift he gives is himself. It's why Jesus said in John 6, 35, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me shall not hunger and whoever believes in me shall never thirst again. Friend, do you know him today? Jesus says, until you come to him, you're gonna continue to be hungry do you recognize your need for him today? Necessity finds him out. Friends, we are all desperate for him. How would you know? Here's a question I pondered this week. How would I know if I'm following Jesus because others may see me do that or that I'm simply following him because of who he is? How would I know? Jesus teaches us before he enters into the Lord's prayer. He says, here's how you know. Your private prayer life will answer the question. Do you follow him to be seen by others? Because it's in your private prayer that nobody sees is what Jesus says. And said, others are out there on the corner. They're out there doing their thing. So everyone will see what they're doing. Convicting question for you. Are you praying before God Almighty every single day? Not only for daily provision, but for his presence. Here's the point. Our prayers reveal our dependence on God. How desperate are you? As we come out of this, this prayer, we recognize that coming into his presence, as we find ourselves knocking on the door, we recognize that he's already there. In Revelation 3.20, he says, I'm the one knocking at your door. And if you open the door, what does he say? He offers a picture. He says, I'll come in and dine with you. I'll break bread with you. What he's saying is, I want to be a part of your life. I want to come into your life. I want you to abide in my love. I want to come in and dine. What he's saying is, I want to be knee to knee, toe to toe, heart to heart. Eyeball to eyeball. I want to be present in your life. Friends, he's ready always for you to come to him. And he's knocking on the door of your heart today. Will you receive him? And then will you go and serve him? Jesus said in John 4, 34, my food is to do the will of the one who sent me and to accomplish his work. He is our sustenance. His purpose for your life is what brings life. He is the bread of life. Come to him and have your fill and go and tell others where they can find bread to eat as well. Let's pray together. Lord, we thank you for this simple prayer that draws us to you. We thank you that no prayer is too small. No need that we bring to you is too small. No need is too big and all of our needs are met in you, not just by you, but met in relationship with you. Thank you for dying on the cross for us. Thank you for forgiving us. 
And Lord, I pray for every person hearing my voice right now who does not know you, that now would be the time, today would be the day where they say yes to you. They'd receive your grace and be forgiven. And Lord, for those of us who need to follow others, even today who've been baptized, others who need to join the fellowship of the church, Lord, I pray today would be the day where we say yes. A small, seemingly small decision that changes the trajectory of our lives. So Lord, move among us as we go to worship you this week. In Jesus' name, amen.